Now let's take a look at one of the most common trouble areas, the equalizer or EQ. There are a few different types, so let's sort that out before looking at how and why we use them. Graphic EQs are probably the most commonly known as they show up in more places than just live audio applications. Typically available in 31 and 15 frequency band models, these are primarily used on the output stage of a mixer to help calibrate how a loudspeaker reacts in a room. While they can be used to modify input source, we most commonly lean towards variations on the parametric EQ for that application. A parametric EQ can have multiple bands or sections of frequency selection and give you options for which frequency you will adjust, the boosting or the cutting you will do to that selected frequency. A fully parametric EQ will have a Q adjustment. This is what we call the shape of the adjustment you will make. You can have a very narrow or a very precise adjustment or a wide Q, which is a very broad adjustment. The simpler variation on the parametric EQ is the semi-parametric EQ. This is what we see on most mid-range analog mixers. This gives you a mix between set frequency bands that you can boost or cut, as well as one or two sweepable bands that allow you to choose a frequency and adjust it. The simplest EQ section you may come across is a fixed EQ, and this is when you only have the option of boosting or cutting the factory set frequencies. This is much like the adjustments all of us have seen in our home stereos. It is still a very effective tool if you know how to use it properly. Now that we've looked really quickly at the various options, we need to know when to use them. Many people have the most trouble with EQing as they are unsure of when to use it or even how. Recalling our goal of trying to amplify as naturally as possible the source at the other end of the microphone, it's always important to get a feel for what that source sounds like naturally. We then do what we can to come as close as we can to that sound as possible. The other way we approach EQing, and this is where the fun really starts, is when we have multiple input sources that tend to have overlapping sonic values and we're looking to create room for each piece to be heard beside the other. For example, if we have a single vocal and an acoustic guitar, there is naturally a lot of space and we typically don't have to do too much. We can allow each one to exist in its natural space. However, if we take those two same elements and drop them into a band scenario, adding a drummer, a bassist, a keyboard player, an electric guitar player, we'll need to make some slight adjustments so that the voice and acoustic are not lost in all of the mix of the instruments. So now let's look at when to EQ. While proficient EQing does take some practice, a good start is to have a general idea of what sources share similar sonic values. Once we know where instruments sit in the sonic spectrum, we can start to make some adjustments to highlight the more important sounds and reduce the less important sounds to make room for the other instruments. With the human voice, for example, as we reduce the low frequencies and lower mid-range frequencies, the higher frequencies that are essential for clarity and, and intelligibility become more pronounced and we can let the band fill in the other spaces. Everyone's ears hear a little bit differently, so it's very hard to train someone to hear. The best practice is to listen critically to some of your favorite recordings and try and isolate each part of the band. Listen to the vocals and how little of the lower frequencies are present. Listen to which frequencies of the guitars are highlighted. This will help train your ears, then you can experiment with the EQ section and find the sounds that you think are appropriate. We are really just scratching the surface here, but I hope this helps give you a better understanding of the tools available, when to use them, and a starting point of how to use them.